Wondery Plus subscribers can binge new seasons of American Scandal early and ad-free right now. Join Wondery Plus in the Wondery app or on Apple Podcasts. It's almost five in the morning on December 9th, 2008. FBI Special Agent Daniel Kane is in the car with two of his colleagues, driving through the pre-dawn streets of Chicago. They've been up since 2 a.m., but Kane isn't tired. He can feel his adrenaline starting to build like it always does before a big operation. For the past five years, Kane has been circling one of Illinois' most powerful politicians, untangling a web of crooks and conmen, trying to get to the man he believes is at the center. And now, Kane finally has all the evidence he needs to pull off what might be the biggest arrest of his career. So Kane knows he can't afford to make any mistakes. That's why he and two other agents are up before sunrise on a freezing December morning. They're on their way to eliminate the last remaining obstacle. Kane pulls up in front of a cozy-looking all-night diner and puts the car in park. The three agents then get out and walk briskly through the cold and into the warm interior of the Golden Nugget Pancake House. It takes Kane's eyes a few seconds to adjust to the fluorescent lights. As he nervously fingers the handcuffs in his pocket, he looks at the other customers and realizes they have no idea what's about to happen. That soon, they'll all be glued to their TVs, watching a massive political scandal unfold. Then, Kane spots the man they've come to meet, a police lieutenant named Roy Sanji. The FBI doesn't always coordinate with the state police, but this time they have no choice. Kane motions to his colleagues, and they walk to the back of the diner where Lieutenant Sanji greets them. Ah, good morning, Agent Kane. Hope this booth is all right. I tried to pick a spot where we wouldn't be overheard. Ah, This is fine. Thanks, Lieutenant. The agents slide into the booth across from Sanji, and Kane flags down a server. Uh, Excuse me, can we do three black coffees? Anything for you, Lieutenant? Sanji shakes his head, and the server leaves with their order. Kane waits until she's out of earshot. Then he leans in so that only Sanji can hear him. So listen, we asked you here to meet us because something big is coming, and we need your help. We've been working on a case that involves corruption at the highest level of state government. And in about an hour, we're going to arrest the guy who we think is pulling the strings. I'm not going to say too much here, but he's big. Lives here in Chicago. Likes to say things like, I'm all shook up. You know what I mean? You you, you don't mean the guy. That's right. Yeah. Just don't say his name right now. Let's just call him Elvis. The server returns to drop off the coffee. He's quieting the table. But Kane watches the police lieutenant's face. He knows he's just dropped a bomb on him. And when the server leaves the table, Sanji is the first to speak. No, look, you, you must be kidding. I know, blo- I mean... Elvis doesn't have the best reputation, but I never thought he'd be arrested. Well, we're hoping that's what he thinks, too, because the key here is going to be the element of surprise. And that's where you come in, Lieutenant. You're in charge of the suspect's security detail. Some of your men are stationed outside his house right now, and and we need them gone. I can't say much more, but can we count on you to tell them to stand down? Well, they've been assigned to protect the um, suspect. I, 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 I can't override. Look... The last thing we need here is a standoff between the FBI and a bunch of state troopers, right? If the suspect hears us and decides to barricade himself in the bedroom, or the press starts swarming the place, nah, we can't let any of that happen. Sanji folds his hands across his chin, pondering the situation. After a long pause, he finally gives a nod. Well, okay. All right. I I mean, of course, Agent Kane, I understand. Uh, Let's see. Just when it happens, give me the word. And I'll tell my men to stand down. Well, good. Then it's settled. Because it's happening now. You better come with us, Lieutenant. Kane stands, and the other men at the table follow. As Kane throws some cash on the table, he realizes that none of them even took a sip of their coffee. It must be the adrenaline. But as he walks toward the door, Kane starts to feel calm and full of purpose. He knows that Lieutenant Sanji will do his part, and everything will go as planned. In less than an hour, he'll be putting handcuffs on one of Illinois' most notorious politicians, Governor Rod Blagojevich.
Achieving a gorgeous grin from home isn't a total mystery with Bite Clear aligners. Just don't be surprised if all of your sleuthing friends start asking, what's your secret? Begin by ordering your at-home impression kit today for only $14.95. Bite Clear aligners are doctor-directed and delivered to your door. Treatment costs thousands less than braces. Plus, they offer flexible financing, accept eligible insurance, and you can pay with your HSA FSA. Get 80% off your impression kit when you use code WONDERY at Byte.com. That's B-Y-T-E dot com. Start your confidence journey today with Byte. Do you ever wonder where all your money went? Like every single time you look at your bank account? Honestly, it's probably all those subscriptions. I felt that way too, until I got Rocket Money. Rocket Money helped me see all the subscriptions I'm paying for, and it was eye-opening. Between streaming services, fitness apps, delivery services, it all adds up so quickly. Rocket Money is a personal finance app that finds and cancels your unwanted subscriptions, monitors your spending, and helps lower your bills. Rocket Money has over 5 million users and has helped save its members an average of $720 a year, with over 500 million in canceled subscriptions. Stop wasting money on things you don't use. Cancel your unwanted subscriptions by going to rocketmoney.com slash Wondery. That's rocketmoney.com slash Wondery. Rocketmoney.com slash Wondery. From Wondery, I'm Lindsey Graham, and this is American Scandal. The city of Chicago has produced some of the most corrupt politicians in U.S. history. But even in the Windy City, Governor Rod Blagojevich stood out from the pack. Over nearly two decades, he ascended through the ranks of Illinois state politics, aided by backroom alliances, quid pro quos, ruthless fundraising, and a big dose of charisma. By the time he reached the governor's office in 2003, Blagojevich had established himself as a new kind of American politician, one who values showmanship over substance and gets rewarded for it. And for a long time, Blagojevich seemed untouchable. While members of his inner circle went down on racketeering and extortion charges, he always managed to slip through investigators' fingers. It took years and multiple wiretaps to bring FBI agent Daniel Kane to Blagojevich's front door. But long before that, Blagojevich was just a young lawyer from Chicago with a limited work ethic and an outsized dream one that reached all the way to the White House. This is Episode 1, Making of a Congressman. It's the mid-1980s, over 20 years before federal agents swoop in to arrest the governor of Illinois. And in a courtroom in suburban Chicago, a young Rod Blagojevich is sitting at the council table, pretending to listen as the opposing counsel gives his closing arguments. Blagojevich holds a pen to the legal pad in front of him and affects a serious face, trying to feign interest. But he isn't writing anything down. He's too stressed. Because the moment this guy stops talking, it'll be Blagojevich's turn to speak, and he has absolutely nothing to say. Blagojevich is a recent law school grad, and this is his first ever jury trial. And so far, it isn't going well. The other side has presented a long list of evidence and expert testimony, but Blagojevich hasn't called a single witness. He honestly thought he could wing it, and now he's kicking himself for being so naive. But that's more or less been the story of his life. For much of his childhood, Blagojevich was overshadowed by his older brother Robert, a smart, athletic, and good-looking kid who seemed to excel at everything he did. Rod was just 16 months younger, with a mop of thick black hair, full cheeks, and close-set eyes. But there was a gap between the brothers wider than their ages. Rod had a temper, and unlike his older brother Robert, always seemed to be struggling in school or falling short of his Little League aspirations. His parents did their best to support him. His father Rade had emigrated to the United States from Belgrade, Yugoslavia, after being held a prisoner by the Nazis during World War II. He took a stern approach with his sons. Meanwhile, Rod's mother Millie had been raised in Chicago by Serbian parents and was more doting begging older Robert to look out for his little brother Rod. But there was one place where young Rod seemed to thrive, the local library. 
Instead of doing homework, he'd spend hours there combing through the nonfiction section, devouring every book he could find on American history and memorizing the contents. He found himself especially drawn to books about politicians like Abraham Lincoln and even Richard Nixon. For Blagojevich, these men represented everything he wanted to be but wasn't. Successful, confident, and most of all respected. He started to dream about one day joining their ranks. And with that in mind, Blagojevich decided to go to law school. He had no special affinity for jurisprudence, but it seemed like a requirement for someone who wanted to become a politician. But Blagojevich couldn't motivate himself to study. For years, he had skated by on his near-photographic memory. But once he got to law school, rote memorization didn't cut it. He nearly flunked out his first year, and it took him two tries to pass the bar exam. Since then, he's been jumping from job to job, seeming to fumble every opportunity that came his way. Now, sitting in this depressing courtroom, Blagojevich is worried he's about to drop the ball again. He's used to feeling unprepared, but this time, he won't be the only one who suffers. His client will, too. He's representing an elderly woman who's trying to stop her adopted daughter and son-in-law from taking control of her estate. If he doesn't win her case, she might lose everything. Finally, the judge calls Blagojevich's name, and nervously he stands and clears his throat. But as he begins to talk, something miraculous happens. The words he hears coming out of his mouth don't sound that bad. In fact, they might even sound good. He starts to get into a rhythm pacing back and forth in front of the jury and yelling things about neglectful children and evidence being withheld due to technicalities, just like he's seen lawyers do in the movies. He even throws in a self-effacing joke or two, calling himself a rookie lawyer and smiling sheepishly at the jury. Blagojevich talks for nearly an hour before he rests his case. And as he walks back to his seat, he steals a glance at the jury. To his delight, he sees they've been eating out of his hand. And it occurs to him, If he can persuade people when he's this unprepared, maybe there's no limit to what he can do. Maybe his charisma is a kind of superpower. An hour later, the jury returns with their verdict, finding in favor of Blagojevich's client. Blagojevich is thrilled. He races back to the office to tell his boss about how he won over the jury with his charm, despite being underprepared. But his boss isn't impressed by the story. Weeks later, he fires Blagojevich for not being focused enough on his work. But Blagojevich's dream of becoming a politician remains unchanged. And in the spring of 1986, he finds an opportunity to get his foot in the door. Blagojevich has a family connection to Chicago politics. He knows a powerful city alderman named Edward Verdoliak. For the past three years, Verdoliak has led an all-white coalition that controls Chicago City Council and blocks almost all of the initiatives of the city's first black mayor, Harold Washington. But now Mayor Washington is trying to shift the balance of power with a court-mandated special election to give black and Latino Chicagoans better representation on the council. With the spring election looming, Blagojevich sees his chance. He offers to help Verdoliak campaign for his preferred candidates, The alderman says he needs help on the northwest side and tells Blagojevich to grab some friends and report to the leader there, a Democrat named Richard Mell. Mell is one of Chicago's most notorious aldermen, a man known for doing whatever it takes to win in a city with a reputation for cutthroat politics. Once, he reportedly recruited a gang leader to help him get out the vote. Another time, one of Mel's campaign volunteers broke both wrists while trimming a potential voter's tree, and Mel publicly applauded the man for giving his all to the organization. So when Blagojevich arrives at Mel's office, he's feeling a little nervous. The single-story red-brick building is unassuming, but Blagojevich knows that the man inside is anything but. He tells his friends to follow him as he walks up to the door and knocks. A distracted-looking campaign staffer opens the door and they walk in. Inside, Blagojevich sees an office in chaos. People are running around, answering calls and tripping over boxes. The place is a mess. Blagojevich even notices a rat scurrying across the floor before he spots the man in charge. Richard Mell is standing at a desk, hunched over a pile of city maps. He looks like he's in his early 40s. His hair has already turned white, but his blue eyes are bright and he's buzzing with energy. Blagojevich knows he has to make a good impression, because if he plays his cards right, Mel could be a way into Chicago politics. 
So he takes a deep breath and tells his friends to hang back while he approaches the alderman. Um, hello, Mr. Mel? Uh, don't call me that. My name's Dick, please. Yes, sir. Well, my, my name's Rod, Rod Blagojevich. And, and what are you doing here, Mr. Rod? Uh, I'm sorry, what was the name? Blagojevich. It's Serbian. And uh, Alderman Verdoliak sent me over here to help with the campaign. Uh, I see. Okay, you brought a couple of friends with you? Yes, that's right. We're here to help wherever we can. Well, look, kid, this is a campaign office, not a daycare center, so I don't have time to deal with a bunch of guys who don't know what they're doing. Respectfully, sir, I'm not a kid, and I'm, I think you could use my help. I'm a lawyer, I'm bilingual, I have a photographic memory, and I've been following the news every day, so I know exactly what we're here to do. Well, you do, all right? So tell me, what? Well, we're here to stop Mayor Washington from taking over our city council. And you know who we're trying to get elected? Manny Torres, sir. He's running against Washington's guy, Luis Gutierrez. Well, all right. I've got some flyers on the table over there to your right. Grab a stack and then go get Manny some votes, okay? Blagojevich assures the alderman that he and his friends will do whatever is asked of them and then turns to go. But before he can leave, Mel calls him back. Mel asks Blagojevich to say his name one more time. Blagojevich repeats it, making sure to say each syllable clearly. Then he flashes Mel an easy smile and then turns for the door, beckoning his friends to follow. Blagojevich knows how to read people, and he can tell Mel won't forget his name again. He's pretty sure he's just landed another high-powered contact on Chicago City Council, someone who one day might even be able to get him elected. On Richard Mel's orders, Blagojevich and his friends paper the ward with flyers for Manny Torres, but ultimately it's not enough. On election night, Torres loses to Mayor Harold Washington's candidate, Luis Gutierrez. It's a small blow to the establishment voting bloc, but Chicago politics marches on, and after the election, Mel turns his focus to other races at the county level, and Blagojevich continues looking for ways to build his resume. He lands a job at the office of the Cook County State Attorney. It's low-level work, but it's a great gig for networking. And while most of his time is spent prosecuting drunk drivers, Blagojevich spends every spare minute cultivating relationships with judges, prosecutors, and other legal power players throughout the city. He works hard at making friends and allies in the hope that someday one of those relationships will help him access the political world he longs to be a part of. And the spring of 1988, one of them does. On March 6th of that year, Blagojevich gets invited to an event by one of the judges he's become friendly with. It's a fundraiser hosted by the man Blagojevich volunteered for two years ago, Richard Mel. Blagojevich is thrilled to attend. The fundraiser is held at a famous old German restaurant in Chicago's Southport Corridor. And as Blagojevich follows the judge into the restaurant, Bavarian chandeliers cast a warm glow over hundreds of guests. Blagojevich scans the room, noticing the paintings and stained glass lining the walls. It's an opulent, old-world setting the kind of place Blagojevich wouldn't mind spending more time in. Then the judge takes Blagojevich by the elbow and says there's someone he should meet. The judge points out a young woman wearing a bright red dress and standing on her own in the corner of the room, looking glum. That, he says, is Richard Mel's daughter, Patty. The judge explains that she was recently dumped by her fiancé and suggests that meeting a nice young man like Rod Blagojevich might cheer her up. Blagojevich never really had any plans of settling down or getting married, but he prides himself on being good with women. He's also intrigued by the prospect of chatting up the attractive daughter of a powerful politician. So he squares his shoulders, straightens his tie, and strides toward her. When Blagojevich reaches Patty, he can tell her mind is somewhere else, probably still on her ex-fiancé. Resolving to make her forget all about him, Blagojevich introduces himself and explains that he knows her father. He starts to tell her about the time he volunteered at Mel's campaign office, but he can tell right away he's boring her. He realizes she probably has guys like him coming up to her all the time, so he decides a more direct tactic. He looks Patty straight in the eye and asks if she'll go out on a date with him. Always the showman, he promises that if she agrees, he'll show her the time of her life. Blagojevich grins confidently at Patty, waiting for her to speak, but instead of answering, Patty starts to giggle. This was not the reaction he was hoping for. Usually, this kind of directness leaves women weak at the knees. But instead of falling into his arms, Patty teases him for being such a smooth operator. Blagojevich should have known his usual tactics wouldn't work on a woman like Patty. She is Richard Mel's daughter, after all. 
so he tells her she's right. The line was a little cheesy. But if she gives him the chance, he'll prove to her that he's more than just another one of her father's political lackeys. Then Blagojevich starts to ask Patty about herself, where she went to school, what she studied, and quickly realizes that Patty is whip-smart and even more well-read than he is. Feeling more relaxed, he starts to open up, telling Patty about his childhood and his dreams for the future. At one point, he even breaks out in song, showing off his best Elvis impression. Remarkably, this seems to do the trick. Disarmed and smiling, Patty writes her number on a cocktail napkin and hands it over. Blagojevich says he'll call her in a day or two, and then heads for the door, tucking her number carefully into his breast pocket. Then, as he steps out into the cool March night, he realizes that his cheeks are flushed and that he likes Patty a lot. He begins to imagine a future with her, knowing that also she could be his golden ticket into Chicago politics. Angie's list is now Angie, and we've heard a lot of theories about why. I thought it was an eco-move. Fewer words, less paper. No, it was so you could say it faster. No, it's to be more iconic. Must be a tech thing. But those aren't quite right. It's because now you can compare upfront prices, book a service instantly, and even get your project handled from start to finish. Sounds easy. It is, and it makes us so much more than just a list. Get started at Angie.com. That's A-N-G-I. Or download the app today. So I'm a father of one. I got to find a babysitter. I found Care.com and I was blown away. Through the platform, I was able to find local and experienced candidates along with their reviews and rates, which were way more affordable than I anticipated. Care.com really put me at ease knowing that they were all required to go through a background check. If you're like me and you need to find someone reliable for your child care necessities, check out Care.com. Find the ideal sitters for your child care needs. Rod Blagojevich and Patty Mel soon discovered that they genuinely enjoy spending time with each other, going on dates to the library, and bonding over their shared love of books. By the end of 1988, after just a few months together, they've fallen deeply in love. But as the two grow closer, someone else in Blagojevich's life begins to fade away, his father, Rade. Shortly before Rod met Patty, Rade suffered a terrible stroke that left him with significant brain damage. For months, Rade was unable to speak or even eat on his own. And then, just before Christmas 1988, Rade dies. Blagojevich is devastated, but the loss brings him even closer to Patty's family, especially Patty's father, Chicago Alderman Richard Mell, who takes Blagojevich under his wing and brings him closer than ever to the political world he longs to be part of. Mel gives Blagojevich a part-time staff job in his campaign office, and there, Blagojevich learns how things really get done in Chicago politics. Some might call it corruption, but for Mel, backroom deals are what make the city tick. He and other powerful aldermen on the city council often withhold liquor licenses in return for political favors or trade government jobs for campaign support. And in Mel, Blagojevich starts to see someone he can rely on now that his own father is gone, as well as someone who has the power to get him elected in Chicago. In Patty, he sees the chance to start a family of his own. So in the summer of 1989, Blagojevich decides to make his induction into the Mel clan official. He proposes to Patty, and one year later, the two are married. Richard Mel couldn't be more thrilled about having a son-in-law who shares his love of politics and government. He sees Blagojevich not just as family, but as a potential political ally. So in January of 1992, Mel decides to make Blagojevich a proposal of his own. That night, Blagojevich has just returned home from a run when he and Patty get a call from Mel, asking them to come see him as soon as possible. Fearing the worst, the couple drive straight over. And when they get to Mel's house on the northwest side of the city, they find him crawling around the living room floor, sleeves rolled up, muttering. Looking down, Blagojevich sees that the floor is strewn with maps of Chicago's voting districts. Blagojevich asks his father-in-law if everything's okay, and from his hands and knees, Mel explains that one of his longtime allies has betrayed him, and he needs someone he trusts to run for the Illinois State House. Then, looking his son-in-law straight in the eye, he asks if Blagojevich will do it. Blagojevich's heart leaps. This is what he's been waiting for, ever since he first walked into Mel's campaign office six years ago. 
But actually, if Blagojevich thinks about it, much longer than that, since he was a kid avoiding homework by reading about Lincoln and Nixon. Blagojevich is eager to accept, but has one concern. He doesn't want to be Mel's puppet. It's not that Mel is a diehard Democrat, while Blagojevich tends to lean conservative. Blagojevich might idolize Republican presidents like Richard Nixon, but political philosophy has always been secondary to his primary goal, getting into office. No, Blagojevich's concern has more to do with public perception. After working in Mel's campaign office for almost four years, he knows the alderman has a reputation for being an operator, and he doesn't want to be seen as just yet another one of the alderman's chess pieces. Blagojevich prides himself on coming from the working class, and he'd hate it if people thought he'd been handed anything on a silver platter. So he steadies himself and asks Mel if he'd have the freedom to take his own position on political issues. Still on the floor, Mel waves him off, but when Blagojevich doesn't respond, Mel looks up and again, staring him right in the eye, promises Blagojevich that he doesn't care about what he does once he's in office. Blagojevich holds out a hand for Mel to shake. He still has some misgivings, but not enough to stop him from accepting Mel's offer. Patty throws her arms around Blagojevich, and as they walk back to the car together, he resolves to do everything he can to make sure people know he's his own man, not just another pawn in Richard Mel's political game. In January 1992, Rod Blagojevich announces he's running for Illinois state representative and begins campaigning hard. The most challenging thing for a first-time candidate is getting your name out to voters. So every day, Blagojevich wakes up at 5 a.m. and hits as many coffee shops as he can before the workday begins. Knowing he can count on his charisma to get him through almost anything, he charms the baristas and entertains the customers shamelessly. Then he spends a few hours at different stops on the L train, hoping to intercept voters on their way to work. No matter how rushed or impatient they are, Blagojevich always seems to be able to melt their frostiness with a self-deprecating joke or one of his favorite Elvis imitations. It's retail politics at its finest, and Blagojevich is a natural. On the best days, the campaign feels like a family affair. Patty spends her days knocking on doors and handing out flyers. Her mother runs the phone banks and the campaign's polling. And Richard Mel works behind the scenes, strategizing and sending out lackeys to rally local support for his son-in-law. The campaign pushes hard for two months. And then on St. Patrick's Day, 1992, the results come in. Blagojevich has won the Democratic Party nomination for state representative. Blagojevich is overjoyed by the news, and he can't wait to celebrate with Patty and Mel. But before they start opening any bottles of champagne... There's someone important he wants to call and share the news with, his mother, Millie. Blagojevich hasn't had many opportunities to make phone calls like this. More often than not, he's had to call his mother with bad news, trying to explain why he flunked the bar or why he was fired from a job. Ever since he was a child, all Blagojevich wanted was to do something worthy of his parents' pride, to make them feel about him the same way they felt about his older brother, Robert. But instead, Blagojevich almost only ever did things that made them worry. But now, Blagojevich feels like he's finally done something big, something even Robert can't compete with. And as he picks up the phone to dial his mother's home number, he imagines the pride he'll hear in her voice as she realizes she doesn't need to worry about him anymore. Hello? Is that you, Rod? Yes, Mama, it's me. What happened? Are the results in? Uh, they are. I won, Mama. You did? Are you sure? Yeah, Mom. <laughs> I'm sure. I did it. I can't believe it, son. Oh, if only your father were still here. Our Rod all grown up and running for office. Of course, you remember how worried we used to be about you. Oh, Mama, I remember. That temper of yours. And you just could never seem to apply yourself. But I'm not that little boy anymore, Mama. I know you aren't, sweetheart, but you must promise me that you'll be careful, won't you? I, I worry about you. Blagojevich tightens his grip on the phone. This isn't the reaction he was hoping for. What do you mean by that, Ma? I'm just saying be honest in your dealings, you know? And whatever you do, do not take any bribes. You promise me? Oh, Ma, don't be ridiculous. I'm being serious, Rod. Promise me, no bribes. Ma... You don't know what you're talking about. No, no, no. I lived in Chicago a lot longer than you, son. And I know a thing or two about how politics are run here. When I think of all the corruption I read about in the newspaper... Ma, what? why would you think I'm going to be like those dirty politicians? Don't you know your son? 
Well, you have a good heart, but we both know you like to cut corners sometimes. And I just want you to promise me that you won't do that this time. There could be real consequences if you do. <laughs> yes. Why can't you just say you're proud of me? I am proud of you. My youngest son is going to be a politician, elected to office in America. I'm just... I'm just asking you to promise that you'll be a good one. Okay? Can you do that for your mother? Yeah, Ma. Of course. I'm not going to take any bribes. I'm not going to do anything illegal. Promise. Nothing. I won't do anything to bring shame on you or, or dishonor Pop's memory, right? Well, thank you, son. You are a good boy. And I know you're going to make me proud. Well... Listen, Ma, I, I better go. Everyone wants to celebrate and Patty is waiting. Of course, dear. Go have fun. But before I forget, I, I was talking to Aunt Daisy the other day. And I was wondering, once you're in office, do you think you can get her son-in-law a job? I mean, that woman helped raise you. And it would be a, a wonderful thing to do for that young man. As his mother goes on, it takes all of Blagojevich's self-control not to burst out laughing. All the resentment and self-doubt that's been building while talking to his mother disappears in a second. She might not know it, but she's just given him the perfect advice for an emerging politician in Illinois. Always be honest, unless you can benefit from bending the rules. Eventually, Blagojevich says goodbye and hangs up the phone. He sits for just a moment, still smiling. He knows his mother is right. Politics in Illinois can be dirty. But thanks to Richard Mell, he knows the game, and he's resolved to play it carefully and to make his mother proud. Staying up late, hanging out with friends, yelling at the game on TV, you do a lot over a big weekend. So when it's time to start another big week, celebrate Hydration Monday with Liquid IV. One stick of Liquid IV and 16 ounces of water hydrates better than water alone and contains eight vitamins and nutrients with no artificial sweeteners. Weekends are for going wild. Have a game plan for Monday with Liquid IV. Grab your Liquid IV hydration multiplier sugar-free in bulk nationwide at Costco or get 20% off your first order when you go to liquidiv.com and use code WONDERY at checkout. That's 20% off your first order when you shop Superior Hydration today using promo code WONDERY at liquidiv.com. For years, Rod Blagojevich dreamed of becoming a politician. He fantasized about making impassioned speeches on the State House floor and hearing the echo of his footsteps as he walked through the halls of the Capitol building. And in November 1993, that dream becomes a reality. Blagojevich wins the general election, making him a state representative. Triumphant and excited, he packs his bags and leaves Chicago for the state capitol in Springfield. But once he gets there, Blagojevich feels a little let down. He quickly discovers that the work of proposing bills and arguing in the legislature isn't as thrilling as he imagined it would be. During session, he's restless and easily distracted and many of his peers don't seem to respect him. Some of them have even given him a nickname, Representative Son-in-Law. Blagojevich hates that people think he's only there because of his connection to Richard Mell. Even so, he's able to charm a few of his colleagues on both sides of the aisle and earns a reputation for being friendly and enthusiastic. Blagojevich could take or leave policymaking, but he still loves being a politician. So by the middle of his first term, he's already thinking about how to get out of the State House and into Congress. Blagojevich sets his sights on winning the seat in Chicago's 5th Congressional District, and in 1995, he announces his candidacy. Blagojevich is thrilled to be back on the campaign trail, but this time the competition he's facing is much fiercer than before. Running against Blagojevich is another State House representative named Nancy Kazak. Like Blagojevich, Kazak was first elected to the State House in 1993. But unlike Blagojevich, Kazak spent that first year proving her commitment to policy. Her efforts got her named Outstanding Freshman Legislator by the Illinois Healthcare Association. And since announcing her candidacy, she's also earned the endorsement of Emily's List, a deep-pocketed organization that seeks to get more women elected to Congress. So to beat Kazak and win this election... Blagojevich knows he needs more than just Patty and Mel in his corner. He needs the help of a real political strategist. And he finds that in David Axelrod. 
Axelrod was once the young hotshot political reporter at the Chicago Tribune before leaving the paper to start his own consulting firm. Since then, he's established himself as a go-to strategist for Democratic candidates in Illinois. Plus, Axelrod likes Blagojevich. They have fun together, and he can tell Blagojevich has what it takes to run a strong campaign. But he also sees that Blagojevich has some unrealistic ideas about what it takes to win. Blagojevich loves retail politics, spending long days charming Chicago voters at coffee shops and train stops. But Axelrod knows that handshakes and Elvis impressions aren't going to cut it now that he's running for Congress. Not even Richard Mell's army of campaigners will be able to knock on every door of the 5th Congressional District. So in January of 1996, Axelrod invites Blagojevich to his office for a candid conversation about the campaign strategy. Axelrod offers a seat, but Blagojevich is so energized he can barely sit still. Well, I got to tell you, Axel, I can't wait to get back out there. I'm sick of sitting in session all day. I want to meet some real people, not puffed up Springfield elitists. Well, Rod, I'm glad to hear it because we have our work cut out for us. Now remind me, what day are you hoping to launch the campaign? On the 8th, the king's birthday. The king, Elvis, Axel. Uh, you know, you know, he's sort of a hero of mine, and I figured starting a campaign on his birthday might, I don't know, give me some good mojo. <laughs> Axelrod laughs. This is why he agreed to work with Blagojevich. He's a born showman, and his humor is infectious. But Axelrod needs to figure out a way to steer this conversation in a more serious direction. Well, okay, yeah, uh, that's, that sounds fine to me. Elvis's birthday, why not, you know? But listen, I want to talk to you about something. I know you and Mel came up with a campaign formula that worked for you last time. It sure did. Worked like a charm. Yes, yes, it did. And you and Mel ran a great campaign. I'm not going to doubt that. But, and I want you to hear me on this, shaking hands and kissing babies aren't enough. The congressional district is just too big. There's no way you're going to be able to get to all of them. But, Axe, I've heard this before. No one thought I could do it last time either. People are always underestimating me. But I'm telling you, Mel and I have this thing in the bag. And I'm telling you, this is a national campaign. It's a whole different ball game, and, that, and you hired me for a reason, didn't you? Oh, of course. And that reason might have been that you know I have experience running campaigns like this. And I don't mean any disrespect, but you, you and Mel don't have that experience. So please listen to me when I tell you that retail politics is not going to get you elected. You need to shift your focus to raising money. Oh, I don't want to spend all day begging rich people for money. I want to be out there talking to the working man. Which is great, Rod, and you will be doing some of that. We'll still need you to turn on the charm for the voters. But whether you like it or not, your opponent is going to be fundraising like crazy. And she's good at it. If you don't get in the game, she's going to leave you in the dust. In the dust, huh? All right, well, you've got my attention. So tell me, once we raise this big pile of cash, what are we going to do with it? Well, a big part of it will be used to run campaign ads on TV and the radio. And those spots do not come cheap. Yeah, but... Mel warned me about that crap. He says it's a waste of money. I shouldn't bother with it. I'm, I'm trying to be delicate here, but Mel doesn't know what he's talking about. I promise you that if you trust me on this, you'll be unstoppable. And, and look, if I'm wrong, I'll apologize to Mel myself. Oh my God. <laughs> Better you than me. <laughs> Still laughing, Blagojevich stands up and agrees to give ads and fundraising a try. Axelrod thanks him and shakes his hand, feeling more relieved than he lets on. He knows that Richard Mel isn't someone you cross lightly, but he has to do what's best for his client, whether Mel likes it or not. Watching Blagojevich leave, Axelrod prays that his stubborn client will be as good at fundraising as he is at knocking on doors. As the primary approaches in March of 1996, it becomes clear that Blagojevich is very good at raising money, and it turns out he loves it. He feels like he could do it every day for the rest of his life. But just as David Axelrod feared, Richard Mel is not happy with the change in strategy. Mel and Blagojevich start to butt heads, sometimes in public. One night, while Blagojevich is giving a speech at Mel's annual bingo fundraiser, Mel grabs the microphone away, telling him to get to the punchline. Blagojevich takes the microphone back and yells, I'm not just a son-in-law. But Axelrod's strategy does seem to be working. By election night, Blagojevich is polling neck and neck with his opponent. And then, after a final sprint of meeting voters and doing interviews, Blagojevich is at home, waiting for the phone call that will tell him if he's won or lost. 
He tries to sit still, but he's too nervous. It feels like everything in his life has been leading up to this moment. This is his big chance to show everyone who doubted that they underestimated him, that he doesn't need Mel to win an election or to make his mother proud. But if he loses, his political career could be over. Pacing his living room, waiting for the phone call, Blagojevich starts to spiral. Maybe he could have raised more money, or maybe Mel was right all along. To calm his nerves, Blagojevich decides to take a shower. He lets the hot water pummel his face and tries to let the sound drown out his thoughts. But then he hears the phone ring. He turns off the faucet and grabs blindly for a towel. Throwing on a bathrobe, he runs to the phone and answers it. As he puts the receiver up to his ear, his heart pounds in his chest. It feels like time is slowing down. Shaking his head, he tries to focus on the voice on the other end of the line. It's someone from campaign headquarters, and they say the final votes have been tallied, and he's won. For a moment, Blagojevich just stands there in silence, water dripping slowly off his hair and onto the carpet. He can't quite process what he's heard, and the voice on the phone asks if he's all right. Clearing his throat, Blagojevich thanks the caller and hangs up. He's won his primary. He's the Democratic nominee for Illinois' 5th District. If things go well in the general election, he'll be on his way to Washington to take his seat in the United States House of Representatives. Blagojevich is elated, but also sobered. He realizes now Axelrod was right. On this big stage, money is everything. And Blagojevich knows that even if he does make it to Congress, he's going to have to keep raising money if he wants to keep his job. Someday soon, maybe even run for an even higher office. From Wondery, this is episode one of Rod Blagojevich for American Scandal. In our next episode, Blagojevich heads to Washington, where he surrounds himself with some of Chicago's most notorious money men and catches the attention of federal investigators. Hey, Prime members, you can listen to American Scandal ad-free on Amazon Music. Download the Amazon Music app today. Or you can listen ad-free with Wondery Plus and Apple Podcasts. Before you go, tell us about yourself by completing a short survey at wondery.com slash survey. If you'd like to learn more about Rod Blagojevich, we recommend the books Golden, How Rod Blagojevich Talked Himself Out of the Governor's Office and Into Prison by Jeff Cohen and John Chase, and A Just Cause by Bernard Seraki, as well as the archives of the Chicago Tribune. This episode contains reenactments and dramatized details. And while in most cases we can't know exactly what was said, all our dramatizations are based on historical research. American Scandal is hosted, edited, and executive produced by me, Lindsey Graham, for Airship. Audio editing by Christian Paraga. Sound design by Molly Bach. Music by Lindsey Graham. This episode is written by Kat Shooknecht. Edited by Emma Cortland. Our senior producers are Gabe Riven and Andy Herman. Executive producers are Stephanie Jens, Jenny Lauer Beckman, and Marsha Louie for Wondery. Okay, so if you had a time machine, how far mm-hmm. in time would you need to go back to be a dominant basketball player of that era? <laughs> I need to go to when Bob Cousy was playing. Back I would, in, in the plumber days? 27 year old Shay would give Bob Cousy the fing business. <laughs> He's not guarding me. Hi, I'm Jason Concepcion. And I'm Shay Serrano, and we are back. We have a new podcast from Wondering. It's called Six Trophies, and it's the best. Each week, Shay and I are combing through all of the NBA storylines, finding the best, most interesting, most compelling ones, and then handing out six pop culture-themed trophies for six basketball-related activities. Trophies like the Dominic Toretto I Live My Life a Quarter Mile at a Time trophy, which is given to someone who made a short-term decision with no regard for future consequence. Or the Christopher Nolan Tenet trophy, which is given to someone who did something that we didn't understand. Catalina Wine Mixer trophy. Ooh, the Lauryn Hill, you might win some, but you just lost one trophy. Follow six trophies on the Wondery app or wherever you get your podcasts. You can listen to six trophies ad-free right now by joining Wondery Plus.